Well, good morning. I am Holly. I'm part of the staff team here at Embrace, although my role is a little unique, or at least the way it plays out is a little unique, because I live in Nashville, Tennessee, but I work here at Embrace, and, and I live in Nashville because of this small thing called marriage, and uh, my husband, that is where his job is from. In fact, you may, or where his job is currently, uh, you may uh, recognize my husband. He's been out here a few times to speak, Chris Brown right there, and that's our our three rascals, uh, but I am so thankful that every few weeks I get to be here in person and uh, just get to worship with you guys together. So I, a big part of my role is that I work with our campus pastors, and so no matter which campus you're joining us from today, whether that is our T campus, our Sertoma campus, our downtown campus, St. Croix, our 57th, or online, I just want you guys to know that your campus pastors are undoubtedly the most exhausting people I know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they are amazing. Well, they are exhausting, but they're exhausting because they want to shepherd you well. And they are exhausting because they want uh, desperately to reach the next person for Jesus. So they're at any campus that you're at, if you see your campus pastors today, I encourage you love on them and thank them and their wives for what they do for our communities. Now, how many of you grew up going to church? Raise your hand. How many of you grew up in church? Okay, awesome. I grew up in church as well. And in my church down south, we had this thing called Wednesday Soul Winning. Did any of you guys go to a church that had a soul winning event once a week? Anybody? Okay. How many of you don't even know what soul winning means? Okay. Awesome, this is gonna be fun. Okay, great. So I had never been to Wednesday Soul Winning until one Sunday our pastor was speaking and, and he asked this question. He says, in the last month, how many people have you told about Jesus and they chose to follow him? Y'all, I'll never forget it. I was sitting in this sea foam green pew and I just started squirming inside because I never had told anyone about Jesus. And so I just started praying, dear God, please do not let him single us out. Please do not let him make us raise our hands. And I know that sounds like a bit of irrational fear, but see, in the church that I grew up in, the, we, it was like public confession every Sunday. It was like, how many of you had your quiet time this week? And everybody that had their quiet time would raise their hand. Of course, those of us who didn't would be sitting there like, oh, great. And, you know, how many of you memorized a Bible verse this week? And so I thought that this was completely normal until, until I grew up and I learned about the Catholics. How many of you grew up in a Catholic church? Okay, I felt so duped. <laughs> I had no idea that you could confess to one person and only one person had to know how bad you were. <laughs> so, so here I am in this mass confessional and I'm sitting here praying, Jesus, please, if you keep him from raising our hands, I promise I will go to Wednesday soul winning every week from now, now till forever, I'll be there. Well, God must have liked my bargain <laughs> because we didn't have to raise our hands that Sunday. So I was like, yes, I'm off the hook. Of course, until Wednesday rolls around and, and I've got to keep my end of the bargain. And so I show up for the very first time to Wednesday soul winning. Y'all, if I'm lying, I'm dying. They put us on this bus. They take us to this neighborhood. The, the driver parks the bus, tells us he'll be back to get us in an hour. And he says, now hop on off and start knocking on some doors. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I was 15 years old. I knew the point was to tell people about Jesus and hopefully get them to want to be a Christian. That's what I knew. <laughs> so I get off this bus, I walk up to this house, I knock on this door, and this all by myself, they just let me do this alone. I, I feel like that's like malpractice. <laughs> but they, I knock on this door, <laughs> and this woman answers the door. Now, she looks like she's about... 38 weeks pregnant, like she's going to pop at any moment. She's got a toddler on her hip and kids screaming in the background. <laughs> and she looks at me, I don't know why, but with this bit of exasperation. <laughs> and being the mature 15-year-old that I am, I just said, I blurt out as quickly as possible, ma'am, this will just take a second. If you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? And then I just froze. <laughs> and I froze because I realized that's all I knew. <laughs> I didn't have any follow-up statements or questions. I didn't have a Bible verse. I didn't have a Bible. If she asked me a question, I had nothing. That was it. That was it. So I stood there with, and looked at this woman who looked at me with like complete be bewilderment, her jaws on the ground, and I just started praying, dear God, just let her slam the door in my face. Just let her slam the door and get this over with. 
Well, come to find out, she was a very nice woman, and uh, she was already heaven-bound, so on to the next house I went, and I did this week after week, determined to keep my end of the bargain with God. Well, then it happened. One week, I was out at Wednesday soul winning, and I spotted these six targets. I mean, I mean kids. I spotted these six kids, and I knew that they wouldn't put me through the ringer like adults did. And so I huddled them up. We all sat down on the sidewalk, and I told them everything I knew about Jesus. It took roughly two minutes. And then I asked them if they wanted to become a Christian. They all said yes. Every last one of them, six of them. And here's what I hate to admit. <laughs> that was the last day I ever went Wednesday soul winning. And why? <laughs> because now if my pastor asked me, I could raise my hand. Have you told anyone about Jesus? You bet I have. You bet I have. And not just one person. I've told six. I've told six. And as a 15-year-old, I felt like six was enough to hold me out at least for my teenage years. Like, I'm good. I'm good. And so I never, I never went back. And when I, when I think back about those days, I laugh inside at how messed up my intentions were. But I know, I know the, the people that took us out to knock on those doors, I know that their hearts are sincere. I know that they wanted our whole town to know about Jesus. But even as a 15-year-old, I remember thinking, there has got to be a better way. I remember with every door that I knocked on and I prayed, dear God, please don't let them be home or if they are home, let them be heaven bound. <laughs> I knew there had to be a better way to go about this. And that's why I've loved this series, Tell the Whole Town, because Adam has been teaching us the better way. We tell the whole town when we share our own story. You see, when we share our own stories, we don't have to be eloquent. We don't have to be well-spoken. We don't even have to have all the answers about God. We just simply have to have a story with him. And you see, like many of you, my story is, and many of you, I'm sure, it just seems to always happen this way, that our stories are often anchored around our greatest pains. And that's true for me. You see, I grew up in a home with a ton of estrogen, okay? There was a lot of estrogen in my home. I've got three sisters. We're all teenagers at the same time. Um, and then I did have a younger brother. But my dad and my brother, God bless them, because it was, it was romantic comedies, boyfriend drama, and clothes fights for a whole decade. For a whole decade. They were significantly outnumbered. But, but my dad, he was my hero. He was a handsome man, he was athletic, he was funny. But what I loved the absolute most about my dad was his way with people. You see, my dad genuinely loved people. In fact, he was a grocery store manager in our small town outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, and he was known for if you left your groceries, uh, you know how sometimes you leave like your bread or your milk at the checkout lane, take everything else and you forget you forget the thing you came for, and you leave them there at the checkout line. My dad was known for, he would, look, he would figure out where you lived, and this is before the days of Google. He would find out where you lived, he'd load your left behind groceries up, and he would deliver them personally to you. See, everybody in our small town knew my dad, and he was about as famous as a grocery store manager could be. But, you know, tragedy struck our home when my dad was just 37, and I was a 12-year-old little girl, you see, the doctors, they found a brain tumor. It was wrapped around my dad's brain stem, and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. My, this tumor was growing, and it was eventually going to take his life. And so at 37 years old, my dad was given six months to live. Now, the ironic thing is that my dad didn't die in six months. In fact, he lived for another 13 years. But during that 13 years, he was never given more than a six month to a one year block to live, expected life. And we were told this every single time he visited his neurosurgeon at Duke University, that the tumor was growing and it was eventually going to eat a vital part, a, a part of his brain that controlled a vital organ. And it would take his life soon. And so he needed to get his family and his affairs in order. And so my family lived in this state for 13 years, this state of hoping and praying against all odds that God was going to heal my dad. But at the same time, we watched this tumor take everything that made my dad my hero. It took his, it took his ability to hit a ball or to run fast. It took his, it took his ability to write. 
his sense of humor, his sense of initiative, even his memory. And then one night, it happened. My dad, he collapsed at home on the bathroom floor. I was a brand new nurse at the time. And so I did CPR on him. And after 30 of the scariest minutes of my life, I lost my first patient and my hero on that bathroom floor. And can I tell you guys that his death set me in a crisis of my faith. And although I had grown up in a Christian home, I could not understand that why, why would a good God allow such a bad thing to happen? And I couldn't understand why a powerful God wouldn't use some of his power to help his people. And so I was a tangled, emotional mess. And I was struggling with, with confusion, with grief, with anger, with failure at not being able to save my dad. I was an absolute mess. And one, one Sunday, a few months after my dad died, my husband woke me up and he said, come on, I'm taking you to church. And we stepped inside of a church that was much like Embrace. And it was in that church that God began to heal my heart. It was through his people that I began to understand God's goodness again. And God did some incredible things in my life through his people and through the local church. And I'm no different than you guys. You see, we all have a story. But maybe you've been here in the last few weeks and you've felt God nudge your heart and say, you need to share your story. But have you left here at all wondering how? How exactly do I go about sharing my story, especially with people who don't seem eager to hear it? You know, I post things on Facebook or on Instagram and I don't get any likes and nobody comments. You know, my world doesn't know Jesus, but frankly, I don't think they care to know Jesus. They definitely don't seem eager to know Jesus. You know, we can't, we can't just march up to, to strangers and say, I know you have a million problems and I got the one answer. That's weird. <laughs> and weird never helps the cause of Christ. We can all write that down. Weird never helps the cause of Christ. And so how do we do this? You know, maybe you have a neighbor who, who you never talk to. You only wave at when you accidentally make eye contact. But you know she's going through divorce. And you know that Jesus could help her. Can you just walk up to her and say, hey, listen, I know you're going through a hard time and I, I have the answer. How do you do that without chickening out? Or maybe, maybe you have a coworker who, who, who is hiding a secret addiction, but you're on to him. And can you just march into their office and say, hey, no judgment, but you're not fooling me. I know you're in deep with this addiction, but I have the answer. How do we do that? Do you want so desperately for the world, for the people around us to, to, to experience the peace that you have found in Jesus, to find the freedom that you have found, but how do you share your story in a world who doesn't care to hear it? I believe the Bible shows us how we can do this well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 9. We're going to jump in right at verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles, no worries. It's going to be up on the screen here. John chapter 9. In verse 1, it says this, that as Jesus was walking along, he saw a blind man who had been, who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It wasn't because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Jump with me down to verse 6. Verse 6, then it says, Then he, Jesus, spit on the ground, made mud with saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, Go, wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed, and he came back seeing. Now I want us to put ourselves in this story. Pretend that we are this blind man. And before we even realize what is happening, two mud pies are applied, one to each eye. I mean, can you not imagine that this man would have been thinking, is this some kind of cruel joke? If this was the Jesus that I've heard about, the Jesus that just can touch people or speak and they are healed, and all of a sudden I'm sitting here with mud pies on my face, do you think, is this a cruel joke? Is this an imposter? Is this a bully that's making fun of me? Here he is with two mud pies, and if that isn't bad enough, he's then told to go and wash in this pool of Siloam. And I'm sure at some point he was probably thinking, did you not 
get the memo. I'm blind. I can't see. I can't get there. In fact, historians tell us that this pool of Siloam was a thousand yards away from where this interaction happened. So that is a little over half a mile away from where this took place. And, and one other thing that we know about this pool is that it is at the lowest point in the city of Jerusalem, which means that he had to walk down at least three flights of stairs. This blind man would have had to walk down three flights of stairs. And it's interesting to note about the stairs in, in Jerusalem, they are all varying heights and widths. Every step is a varying height and width. And I remember I was over there a few years ago, and I remember noticing this immediately when we got into the city of Jerusalem. And I asked my guide, I said, hey, what's the deal with all the stairs around here? They're so wonky. Like one, you've got to take this huge step, and then you take small step, small step, and then you take another giant step. And I'm like, what is the deal? And um, she said, oh, that's intentional. They've done this from the very beginning. We've, we, uh, we've built the city this way because this is a reverent city, and we don't want people. It's a holy city, and we want people to act reverent in it. So the steps have been built in a way that you have to think about every single step you take. There's no pattern. There's no rhythm to it. You have to think about every step you take so kids can't come running through the city. And so think about this. This poor blind man has got to walk down three of these flights of stairs and over a half a mile away to get to this pool that Jesus sends him to. Now here's my question for all of us today. How do you think that this man would have gotten to this pool? How would he have gotten there by himself? You know what I think? I don't think he got there alone. I don't think he did. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us for sure, but I think that there must have been a family member or a compassionate friend or maybe an innocent bystander, but somebody was present and saw this interaction go down. And somebody stepped forward towards this man in his pain and said, come on, let me help you. Let me help you get to this pool. I don't know why. That is Jesus because I've seen him heal other people. This is Jesus. I don't know why he's doing it this way this time, but come on, I'll help you get to this pool. And you see, I think this is exactly how we share our story in a world that's not eager to hear it. See, we earn the right to share our story. We earn the right to share our story first by just being present in people's lives. And being present is a big thing in a world of computers and, and technology. Being present matters today. And we, we can be present just simply by showing up. In Romans 12, 15, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. You know, in 2017, I honestly think to be present in someone's life, to show up in someone's life simply means we put our phone down and we engage so deeply in the lives of other people that when they laugh, we are laughing. And when they cry, we are crying with them. I think in 2017, uh, being present in people's lives means that we meet them on their own turf first. You know, in a world of Amazon Prime or, Prime or food, food Dudes or, or Uber, where everyone comes to our doorstep and gets us, I think we earn the right to share our story by being present, by going to people first. We show up on their own turf. We meet them at the workplace. We meet them at the gym. We meet them at the coffee shops. And we start to make a difference in their life on their own turf. You see, when we do this, when, when we share our time, when we share our lives with people, they will ask us about our story. They will ask us why. And see, this is the whole purpose. This is the whole point. As, as Christ followers, we're not, we're not here to prove a point. We're not even here to push an agenda. We are here simply to make a difference in people's lives. And when we make a difference, they will ask us why. And that why, why? Did you come to my kids' ball game when you have three of your own? Why did you take the day off work to help me move? Why did you tell them to quit talking about me behind my back? Why did you help me with that presentation? You see, that why is the moment you know that your presence has made a difference and they are ready to hear your story. You have earned the right to share your story with them. And finally, I think... <laughs> Uh, not only do we earn the right to share our story by being present, we earn the right by taking people's hands. You see, just as someone 
bent down and took this blind man's hand and said, come on, I'll help you get to this river. I will show you the way to this river. I can't help but think Jesus did not have to do it that way. That's a very unconventional way to heal someone. But maybe he did it that way because he wanted to insert a third person. You know, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 that we are a part of his miracle working process. He says that we are laborers together with God. See, he, we are his partners. It is up to us as Christ followers to look for blind people who need to see, for depressed men and women who are struggling to get out of bed, for people who are drowning Drowning in the shame of their past failures and mistakes. People who are drowning in the throes of anxiety, of stress, of debt. We are to look to them. And we are simply to say, come on, come on, take my hand. I'll bring you to Jesus. I'll bring you to Jesus. And as we're walking them to Jesus and we're helping navigate the way for them and we're saying, don't step or don't trip. It's a huge step. Take a big step now. Okay, now take a baby step, a baby step. Okay, now, now we're in the clear for a while. While we're guiding them, we share our story. We remind them, you're not alone. You're not weird. You're not a lost cause. I used to be blind. I used to be depressed. I was so broken. I was hurt so deeply. I didn't think I would ever trust another person again. See, we remind them that we are just like you. And the only difference in my story and your story is that I've met Jesus. I've met the one that heals blind eyes, that makes depressed people have a reason to live again, that breaks chains. I've met him. And we share that along the way. We simply take their hand and we lead them to Jesus. You know, I told you guys that after my dad died, I stepped inside of a church much like Embrace. But what I didn't tell you was when I stepped inside of my, that church, guys, my eyes were so swollen from crying for weeks and weeks on end. I had a lump in my throat. Have you guys ever had that? Just a lump so thick in your throat. It felt like a beach ball. I couldn't even speak because the tears would just flood out of me. And this man met, comes up to my husband and I in this lobby, and he, he looks at me, and he says, you have a beautiful smile. Would you be willing to use that smile to help other people feel welcome? And guys, I sat there, and I looked at him, and I was like, say what? Are you kidding? Wait, what? Did I hear you right? You want me to volunteer? Have, have, can you see these bags? <laughs> and if you knew if you only knew what was going on inside of my heart. Man, I don't even think God is good. In fact, I, right now, I think he's cruel. And I don't even think this Christian thing is worth it. You would never want me to serve with you. But at the same time, something inside of me was just whispering, Molly, just do it. Take a step. And without even realizing it, I grabbed that man's hand. And I took a step towards Jesus that day. And the next Sunday, I showed up to serve. And I stood on this door and I said, welcome to Elevation. And I said it through tears in my own eyes and through a lump in my own throat. But you know what I noticed instantly? Instantly, I noticed that there was a world that I didn't even know existed before my dad died that I could now see. There was a depth of pain in people's eyes that I could point out from a mile away. I could see hurt and I could see pain like never before. And I left there that day feeling like this gaping wound my dad's death left in my heart just got its first stitch. And week after week, I showed up to serve. And week after week, my heart received stitch after stitch after stitch. And see, I began to slowly understand that my God was indeed a very, very good God, that he didn't cause this pain, that he was hurting with me, and yet he was going to walk with me through this pain. He was not going to leave me alone in it. And while he didn't cause it, he definitely was not going to waste this pain, that there was purpose for my pain. There was purpose for my life. There was a reason to get out of bed again. And simply because a man stuck his hand out and said, come on. I know what serving can do in your life. I'll take you to Jesus. I'll take you to Jesus. I stand here today and I tell you that I was healed through serving, that I fell in love with God again simply because someone stuck their hand out and rescued me.
and embrace. Can I tell you this morning that that is exactly why we exist. That is what the local church is for. You see, it's a beautiful partnership where each and every one of us, we go out into the city. We show up in people's lives. We make a difference. We earn the right to share our story, and we reach out and we take their hand and we bring them to a place where we know that we know that we know that they are going to experience Jesus. And then as a body of Christ, we all stand unified, completely committed to keeping this all about Jesus, only about Jesus, so that we have confidence to bring people inside these doors knowing that they will meet with Jesus. And I just encourage all of us this week, it is a a new season, it's a new school year, which means new routines, new schedules, and I can't think of a better time for new breakthrough, for new peace, for new freedom for people. And maybe taking someone's hand is simply inviting them to church. Hey, I'm taking you to church with me. So you can talk to people like that when you've earned the right with them. You can say, I'm taking you to church with me, I'll buy you lunch after, but you're coming with me. Maybe it's saying, you know what, my church is kicking off small groups next week. I've never been a part of one, but I'm going to be a part and I want you to come be a part with me. Let's try this out together. Maybe it's encouraging someone to come serve, because maybe you have the same story I do and serving has changed your life. When you focus on someone else's pain, even for just an hour, you realize that your pain begins to heal. I don't know what the answer is, but this I know. I know that all of us can think about one person Challenge us all. Think of one person this week that you've already earned the right and let this be the week that you just simply take their hand and bring them, bring them to Jesus and let him do the rest of the work. We leave it in his hands. Can we pray? God, I thank you. I thank you for your healing work in our lives. God, I thank you for the work to be done, and I thank you that you use us to be a part of your process in healing others. I pray, God, that you help all of us to identify one person, one person that we've already earned the right to share our story with. Give us the boldness, the courage, and the determination this week to simply reach out, take their hand, and bring them to you. We love you. We worship you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.